through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 234. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Jack the Giant Slayer, yeah. we're going to be discussing fairy tale movies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're using sort of a loose yes. concept of fairy tale movies. Anything, I guess you would say, there's a. Uh, Kind of a fantastic, I mean, a fantasy element definitely helps. But also, or sort like of a, a moral. Yeah, there's, moral. Sometimes there's the idea of like a child learning a lesson yes. or a child being revealed to something. Yes. If we just pick stuff based on fairy tales, it would basically be the best Disney animated movies because right. they're they're like the most legit crossovers. So yes, but we're not doing that. No, we're just we wanted to spread it out a little bit more fun. And that fun begins with an awesome movie, yes. which actually we just rewatched last uh, fall. Awesome. And that is Labyrinth. Yes. You know, you know, it's no surprise when we're talking fairy tales that, you know, you get a Jim Henson project because he did the whole J Jim Henson storyteller mm -hmm. thing for years that was just fairy tale releases. And it's also interesting because, I mean, with, you think about Jim Henson, you obviously think, you know, the Muppets or yes. Sesame Street or something like this. And this is probably, I mean, not... Not, I mean, obviously there are Muppets in it, but it's mm -hmm. probably one of the least Muppeted yes. projects that he has. The least has. with the creature shop, yeah, not like, counting like Farscape later yeah, on. Yeah, it's, it's very much about the people, which yes. are obviously David Bowie and Jennifer Connelly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're the sort of lead of it. I guess yes. it's sort of more Sesame Street-ish in that way. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. But yeah. it's about a girl whose baby brother is mm -hmm. kidnapped and taken to this foreign land. She wishes land. that he would just go away, and then he disappears. And then the, was it the Goblin King? Yep. Is that what he is? Yep. The Goblin uh, King. Comes in and swoops in and mm -hmm. takes him, and she's forced on a journey to... Get him back. Yeah, to rescue life. him back because the Goblin King, I believe, is going to like make him his. Or and learns that she loves her mm -hmm. baby brother after mm -hmm. all. This is early Jennifer Connelly. Like, yeah, I, I want to say she was like in her teens when this movie actually came. Uh, out. I feel like she, I think you're right. Okay, so it was '86 and she was born in '70, so she was yeah, 16. 16 wow, yeah. 15 probably when it was being filmed. Yeah, so she 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 was a she was mm. a young one, but <laughs> still so tasty. I, I mean, I it's funny. I remember seeing this film as a kid. Mm -hmm. But I don't know at what point I actually realized it was Jennifer Connelly in it. Like, I think I wasn't aware of Jen Jennifer Connelly into, like, career opportunities or For inventing For me, it was habits. The Rocketeer. Or The Rocketeer, When I saw yeah. The Rocketeer, I was like, holy crap, that's the girl from Labyrinth. See, I think I, think I enjoyed all those movies, and then it was like, upon... A, a further viewing of Labyrinth, mm. I was like, oh my god, that's mm, Jennifer mm -hmm. Connelly there. So, yeah. it's, I mean, I had enjoyed Labyrinth like, as a I, kid. Yeah, even, I think we all knew it was Bowie, even if we didn't know Bowie at the time, because yes. he was just so... I mean, well, he was already famous. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is Bowie, like, he's, he's done stuff yeah. since oh, then, totally. but this is like Bowie when he was, like, peak of his fame. Yeah, pretty much. Which is kind of funny that he would want to do this, but I mean, it's not to say this is, is a bad though, movie, but... Is it funny? It's, an, it's one of his best roles. Definitely... More well, interesting I mean, than the man who fell to earth. <laughs> but I mean, we're saying that this dude has done very limited know, acting, know, like know, so. It was a grading on. He a was great as Tesla in, uh, and and uh, Prestige. Yes. yes, yes, he was. But that was again. You know, I know. I know, I know. It's like a handful of roles we're talking Shut about. Shut up. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that of all the things, the only things. That, I mean, I guess it's not surprising they got nominated for visual effects awards, and mm. it was only the BAFTAs, and that's well, pretty much it. Not much else beyond that. Wow. I mean, I'm surprised that. The yeah. Academy wasn't really into something like this. I think this is one of those films that I think it did okay when it came out, but it really developed a cult following Definitely. afterwards. Because, I mean, you talk about it now, and everyone seems yeah. to love Labyrinth. It and The Dark but... Crystal, I think both were not necessarily the most profitable movies in the long run, but, pro you know. But they've developed a cult following. It was funny. I saw this. I was... I was on vacation with some friends mm. and it was on cable one morning I just sat down and was like I'm just fucking watching yep. this all the way through and it's it still it holds up pretty well so, something that blew my mind because I've seen that movie so many times and like you know you think with like fairy tale Wizard of Oz type stories that some that something like this would have been more obvious to me and I would have picked up on this before yes that is obvious yes thank though you. I don't know what you're but the about. sources of all the characters in the film can be seen in Sarah's bedroom in the beginning of the movie check mm, this out usual suspect shit there. yeah exactly she's a stuffed animal that looks like Sir Didymus on the dresser, a doll that looks like Ludo on the shelves next to her door, along with the book Where the Wild Things Are, hmm. a fiery doll on the shelves next to her bed, bookends with the goblins re reminiscent of Hoggle on her dresser, wow. a figurine of Jareth on the right-hand side of her desk. And this is what's even crazier to me. After you see the Hoggle bookend, there's a scrapbook shown. It shows newspaper clippings of Sarah's famous actress mom with another man, David Bowie. 
Like, they even have a picture of oh. Bowie in the room. In addition, the dress she wears in the ballroom scene can be seen adorning the miniature ball in her, the miniature doll in her music box. The wooden maze game is on her dresser next to the books, reminiscent of the hedge section in the labyrinth. And there's a small painting on her wall that depicts the contraption used by the cleaners that they have to escape from. And there's even a copy of the M.C. Escher phono, phono from the final confrontation with Jareth. So what I... That is set design. What I take away from this is that Kaiser Sose is behind this all. Yeah, pretty much. Like, That's awesome. like I wonder. I almost hope in uh, that they filmed the whole movie and then made that scene. Then they were like, okay, everything that we can find, let's stuff into this room because that just so cool. That's like, was it? Uh, was it Paul Thomas Anderson mm -hmm. with? Uh, the frogs. Um, oh, Magnolia. Yeah, with yes. all the number eights oh, yes. or whatever. Oh, yeah, the twos and about. eights. Yeah. God, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Just crazy. I love that kind of intention to detail, even if it's only for one scene. As much as I love Labyrinth. Yes. And it's a fun film. The next film we're going to talk about, <laughs> Yeah. I love even more. And oh, I think yeah. probably everyone out there would yes. say the same. I don't know. I mean, there might be a small percentage who are like, Labyrinth over there. <laughs> but we're talking <laughs> The Princess Bride. Yes. This is the classic. I mean, this is like a true fairy tale from mm -hmm. a, a grandfather told to a sick Yep. Grandson. Yep. I mean, uh, William Goldman novel originally. Very, uh, very well written book. But it's about uh, a, a man who journeys through like danger mm -hmm. to rescue a princess and save her because yep. he's true love yep. and all that stuff. As you wish. But. It's, at the same time, there's there is some depth to the story. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for instance, I think the biggest one, obviously, being Indigo Montoya, yes. who at the beginning of the film starts out as a, a villain, villain yes. but turns into arguably one of the biggest heroes in yeah, the movie. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, it's 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 such a fantastical journey that almost, in some ways, I mean, obviously, Labyrinth is fantastical, and almost yes. in some ways, it feels. As fantastical, if not more fantastical, yes. you know, because you have the Andre the Giant ogre mm -hmm. who's so big that it's like beyond belief, even yes. though he's a real person. But you have like, you know, climbing up the walls, the mm -hmm. creatures in the water, yeah, the rats of unusual size. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that make it seem beyond belief yes. because it is a fairy tale, but at the same time, it's 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 very grounded in yeah. kind of a reality. Yeah, and so it sort of merges those two mm -hmm. in one, and I, I mean, it's so wonderful. I mean, you got yeah. great actors like Carrie Elwes as the, mm -hmm. the lead, Mandy Patinkin as Indigo Montoya, Robin Wright as the Princess Bride, mm -hmm. the titular Princess mm -hmm. Bride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No actual name, just the Princess yes. Bride, yes. which is always fun. <laughs> yes, and uh, it, it's just so, it's so well done. Rob Reiner, who has yes. done so many great films, this is right during the thick of his great mm -hmm. films that you know it's. Yeah, uh, Carrie Elwes and Mandy Patinkin st uh, performed all of their own sword fighting for the <laughs> whole sword fighting stunt. The only, according to Rob Reiner, the only stunt p performed by a stunt double was the crazy double flip when they're talking, when he does the like yes crazy back flip. Right, yeah. sure. Like that's the only everything else. All the sword fighting they like actually learned to sword fight with both hands and learn a m number of uh, appropriate era specific sword fighting techniques. It's also funny to think that Mandy Patinkin is now on Homeland, which yeah. blows my mind. I'm like, oh, Indigo Montoya? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I, th I think when I watched, um, what is it, not uh, Dead Like Me, I was also surprised uh, yeah. to be like, holy crap, is Indigo Montoya? He did other films yeah, besides he did other things. his actual person. And he I, seems I, like a fictional I person. I still, too. every time I watch that movie, I'm amazed by the fact that Christopher Guest is the six-fingered man. I never remember that. That always catches me off guard. Or it's nice to see Wallace Shawn not as a teacher. Yes. Yes. Seems to be his thing in every other <laughs> lot in life. But, I mean, he's so funny. As yeah. Like oh, God. Yeah. The antagonist. The Sicilian. Yes. It's so funny. <laughs> it, I mean, it's sad to think about, but this film only got nominated for an original, or best uh, original song at the Academy Awards. Wow. I mean, it got nominated for a Grammy for instrumental background score and... Hmm. It won People's Choice Award at the Toronto Film Festival. That's wow. probably the most prestigious thing. And the script got only for a Writer's Guild Award, but you know, no Academy Award there either. So it's it's for as beloved as this film is, it really it deserves more recognition. You know, I'm looking at this list of of movies we got, and I get a feeling that I'm like most of these movies are more cult classics than I think they are box office success. There's a few near the end that kind of blur the line better. As special effects, I think, got better. I th I th well, I also think you know it's there's an element of 
fantasy that just is not necessarily the most I mean I guess I guess it depends on what you talk about because obviously like things like the Lord of the Rings are fantasy yeah. and they made a lot of money but I think it th fantasy might be a tougher sell yeah, to I mean, audiences it, because it, yeah when you have settings settings are easier for people to turn their brain off and not think about it and be like oh I don't want to see a space movie like who cares what the space movie is about I don't want to see a space I, movie I, th I think there's just so many bad ones that like it, you know thanks the, Uwe Boll yeah people get turned off on it, and so it, it takes like the the special ones it's true. that sort of stand out from that to make fortunes. But when people find those ones, they yes. see them so many times. Uh -huh. And I think this is one that sort of maybe not initially caught the world on yes. fire, even though I mean it's 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 you know it it's just it's a wonderful film, and I'm yeah. glad that it took a while. I mean, it made $30 million in the U.S. during its in initial oh, run, okay. which is so not not, it's not terrible. terrible. It, I mean, it cost only 16 huh. so, it, so did, it was an actual success. It, it, it was huh. successful, but not to the level that it is now. Like, no. now, again, you know, much like Labyrinth, anyone you talk to about it mm -hmm. loves it. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely in that category. Everybody quotes that movie. Yeah. Another one that's probably in that category of cult classic mm -hmm. is Willow. Oh, yeah. From director Ron Howard. Mm -hmm. Most uh, notably because it stars Warwick Davis for me as Willow. Yep. Warwick Davis. Love him. The and young, Val Kilmer as Mad Mardigan. Yes. The reluctant dwarf mm -hmm. as it is, just, that's forced to save a baby from, was it, an evil queen? Yep. I mean, I mean how much more classic fairy tale do you get yeah. than that? Like, saving a baby in general is pretty common, like saving a younger child or sure. a baby. But saving from an evil queen. And a dwarf. I mean, there's... And there's, a dwarf who's been trained by the good witch, you know? I, I mean, mean, it's just like, it's perfect. It's definitely like emerging of things like, you know, was it Snow, Snow mm -hmm. White and stuff like and that. And Star Wars. You, wow, got your, I, you got your Han Solo, <laughs> Val Kilmer. It, it probably—I mean, George Lucas was a writer on it, so yeah. I'm sure that's a significant yes. portion of it. But uh, it's just—it's so fun, and I mean, Warwick Davis has such an interesting career yes. that I mean, I, I kind of feel bad for him <laughs> because if he were—this was like his breakout. This was or it's supposed to be yeah, like because oh, he had done so much stuff for Lucas in Star Wars, yes. but he was all you know he was wicked, he was in a mask and things like that, and so this was supposed to be like the the actor behind it is we can make him yeah, a star of I his mean, own it, movie. It was it was his breakout in some ways, but the problem is like there's always going to be sort of a limited threshold for getting little people into films. I mean it's it's unfortunate it's much like you yeah. know gender or yeah. race or whatever. It's just one of those things that maybe someday you'll Peter be Dinklage able to just slowly help and break that mold a little bit with just the success of Game of Thrones alone is enough that people are yeah. almost like less but that was also a role written like that, wasn't it? No, I mean the character in the so you know, was a I mean dwarf, but it is, it is until in there's as well. But I, I'm saying until okay, like yes. you get some okay. like you have a film like yeah. Star Wars. So you have a film like Star Wars being cast. Everyone wants to be in it. Yeah. It's sort of like you know them recasting uh, Evelyn Salt in Salt as Angel yes. and Jude. That's a male role that they That's recast right. as a woman yeah. until they recast like um, Luke Skywalker as a little person. I see what you're saying. Then it's I sort of they, it's until those roles are changed. Okay. Yeah, then I would agree. For yes, someone definitely like that. that and yeah. so, unfortunately, he's working against the stream. But in terms of mm -hmm. this, you know, Val Kilmer had done a ton of things at mm -hmm. this point. I mean, he had done a real genius. Yep. He'd done Top Gun. Yes. And so, to see him in sort of a fantastical one was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd lived most of his dialogue. The, this, I, th I think, from what I remember at least, the special effects were pretty, pretty impressive, yeah. especially given the time that they were done. Yeah. And this was. You know, Ron Howard sort of breaking out of mm -hmm. that mold. I mean, he had done Splash yeah, that's before right. this, but, you know, he had not... I mean, this is definitely, by comparison, a massive, massive increase in scale and production. Yes. Obviously, things yes. like Backdraft and whatnot, mm -hmm. Apollo 13, followed after. But, again, this is much like sort of maybe a little bit to a smaller degree, but it's also a bigger scope than The Princess Bride. It it was it was sort of it wasn't a complete failure, but yes, I mean it cost it was 30, not enough. thirty-five million dollars. It made about sixty in yeah. America. So it, it, I mean it wasn't a complete bomb, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like it burst the doors off yeah. like something like Apollo thirteen or whatever would later go on. What's do. interesting if you're an avid reader out there, especially if you like to read fantasy, or if you're just a huge fan of the movie Willow. Um, the box office tolls, as we just said, were not exactly as inspiring as they should be. And so George Lucas, he'd wanted to make more movies, but
but instead he converted them into books, mm. and he got um, he got Chris Claremont, who was a, a comic writer, comic writer, did, did like a lot X-Men. of X Men, yeah. tons of uncanny X Men, and the X Men Future Days Past that's coming out is mm, I think a Chris Claremont story. I mean, really prolific X Men yeah. writer to write these three books called uh, the Chronicles of the Shadow War that came out in ninety five, ninety six, and two thousand. They are amazing. I have read and them. This is about Willow. It's Willow. It's after Willow. Is Willow in them? Yes, as oh, is Mad Mardigan. Man, see, I'm uh, almost like I'm gonna be the minority here. That mm-hmm. I'm kind of more intrigued by the possibility of more Willow movies Dude, than I am Star Wars movies. I, I will just, I will just say without giving anything away that they basically take he takes Willow and makes him into a serious badass. Like this is like grizzled Willow post some bad That's things awesome. going on, and they he like changes his name, but he still got the brownies with him, and he's like a hardcore badass wizard. Wow. It's they're a phenomenal trilogy. Let me throw and Elora Dannon's like a teenager. Like that's how, that's the time progression. So it's like 10, 15 years later. Okay, given that information, let me throw a few things at you. Okay. These might not be a surprise, but it was nominated for best visual effects mm-hmm. and best sound effects editing at the eighty nine Academy Awards. Which, as I said, I thought the visual totally effects worthwhile. held up pretty yeah. well, and they were pretty impressive for the time. So yeah. good on you guys for that. But, but, uh, you spoke about those stories being good. Yeah. The screenplay for this was nominated for worst or, uh, worst screenplay at the Razzies, and Bill Billy Barty was nominated for worst supporting actor. Ain't that some shit right there? I I I I don't know. I like conceptually. I like the idea of the Razzies. Yeah. Some films just definitely deserve to be yes. re- awarded yes. because they're terrible. Yes. But frequently, more frequently than not, it seems like the Razzies are. I gotta look and off. see when the Razzies started because I, I get a feeling like whenever we're looking at these older Razzies, they always just seem like they seem like. A, but I feel like I, the, don't know. I feel like this is like then you know twenty five years from now we're gonna be like Jack and Jill that was a great one I don't know how no. they could award no. Jack and Jill no, we, we won't Oscar. we won't well that's what I'm saying like it seems <laughs> it seems like that must be what happens though because they're like this is the worst screenplay will I mean. Either, I either guess, sometimes yeah. we, we need to start our own 20 to 20 awards for the Razzies. <laughs> like, seriously, like, they got the Oscar ones already. We call them the strawberries. Yeah, I mean, just Christ. Yeah. Moving right along, though. <laughs> let's move to another one that is, again, in that niche of yes. films that are have a cult following but yes. never really received commercial success. And that yes. is Steven Spielberg's Hook. Which I loved. I've seen this movie so many times. This movie I grew up with. Yeah, I mean, this is a film... Uh, never mind. I guess it did make a lot more money than I thought. It cost $70 million to make, which seems amazing. Jeez. But it made $300 million. So it Well done. Yeah, well done. I think this it. movie gets panned a lot, I think, well, is what more you're yeah, thinking. I think, Even though it was maybe a box office success, I think it was one of those things where people were like, oh, yeah, this average movie did well. You know what I bet? I bet it is. I bet it's the cult of Spielberg at the time. He was so big... That it was like everyone you had to go That's see Spielberg's yeah. movie, and so everyone went and Robin saw Williams it. was pretty huge too. Because this is yeah. what is this after Aladdin? I'm trying to remember. No, this is before okay. Aladdin. Okay, but I mean, he's still Robin he's Williams still is still huge. definitely I mean, doing stuff. I'm just saying for the family oriented yeah. five of him, and it's like. I feel like that's a lot of the flat the flack that this movie gets in retrospect is people that are kind of over the Robin Williams character being Robin Williams and zany and wild and I think some people really? I don't yeah. think he's really that zany and wild I actually think this is a much more I, th- I think the bigger thing is that you know they got the impression that this is going to be a Peter Pan movie and it's mm. definitely not your traditional Peter Pan movie True. I mean it is it's but it's based on a book and play called Peter and Wendy that actually did exist which so I mean it's not like it's not something they made up just to throw adults as Peter Pan it's like established work I, I mean it, it is but I don't think that's as mainstream as Peter Pan itself oh proper. no definitely and I, th- I think the notion of like a man trying to relearn what it was like to be a boy sort mm-hmm. of and Come in a land where they never grow up, which mm-hmm. I mean, talk about fairy tale yeah. type stuff. It's, I mean, I think that's an element of it. I, Hook was sort of over the hill. I mean, I, I think the or, fact uh, that uh, Dustin Hoffman's Hook is so present in the movie is also something that threw people off. I mean, it's even called Hook. Like he's as much of a main character and has as much roles and scenes where it's just about you know, like he's in, the main actor in the scene. But I think I think you know there's an element of the original story where it's about sort of the clash between Peter Pan and Hook. Oh, That's yeah. such a big deal. Whereas in this movie, essentially everything's turned on its head. Peter Pan is old. Hook yes. is old. He's wearing like he's got no hair. He's yes. got a wig. I mean, was it Smee? Was it Smee? Smee yeah. is old. Mm-hmm. Like the crocodile's dead. Like mm-hmm. none 
none of it is the same yeah. as you get used to it. And frankly, I think the, the the worst thing about it, and I'm saying this with a, with a, a even saying with, you love the movie with a grain of salt. Yeah, the kids sort of are a little Peter Pan's kids of the song. Yes, yes. like are a little bit a little bit. Um, Challenging, which is funny because one is like Charlie Korsma who mm-hmm. went on to do a lot of great stuff, yeah. but like they're they're just a little bit I don't know whiny maybe like yeah. and it, see that's the funny thing is you know original Peter Pan was much more about the not only the kids but the love story between Peter Pan and Wendy and this is much more about the clash between Peter Pan and Hook. Almost. Yeah, Wendy is not really a presence at all. I mean, if anything, yeah. it's more about like uh, Tinkerbell playing mm-hmm. up her role, sort of as sort of like. Her love of Peter, mm-hmm. and, Julia Roberts. Yeah, which and again that might be another reason. This was just like star-studded cast. Yeah, I mean I think it's unfortunate. I mean I'm glad it made it money. Rufio, it worked, come on man. Yeah, Rufio's Rufi- classic. Oh! Yeah, Rufio's classic. I I mean I'm glad to hear it made money. But you're right. I think it was one of those films that uh, it made it. It it might have made a ton of money, but mm-hmm. it's it's that sort of bad taste that makes it have pushed people away yeah. as, instead of like pulling people in as a cult yeah. classic. It's also though. crazy to think that like Dame Maggie Smith was in this movie playing like a 92 year old woman and she was only like 57 at the time so now as she's actually like getting closer to approach that age and you look back at Hook she still doesn't look as old as that role. It's like she is just kind of eternal. It's funny to think that this film got nominated for five Academy Awards. Wow. It didn't win any of them but it got nominated Maybe, for art Set direction, okay. costume design, totally. visual effects, makeup, and original song. I can see that. The flying is amazing in the movie. It's not. It's well really done. Well I mean, done. it's a Spielberg movie, though. Yeah. And this is seventy million dollars, mm-hmm. and was nineteen ninety one. Yeah. That's probably like a hundred and yeah. something now. Yeah, exactly. So, That's like c- approaching John Carter levels of yeah. Budget. So I mean, <laughs> considering <laughs> that, it's not a surprise that the effects yes. were pretty awesome. And I, I mean, I just I like the story about Peter sort of returning to. Mm-hmm. Uh, the love of life. Like, he yeah. seems so beaten down in the beginning. And he's like he, a lawyer or something. I yeah, and he exactly. learns to love his life and family again. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's it's just so wonderful to see that. And I just, it's, I just The movie it. has such also classic, like, Spielberg to just throw a bunch of things in the background or a bunch of actors and peoples and things. Like, this is, like, I think Gwyneth Paltrow's second role because she plays uh, Wendy. Really? Yeah, the young Wendy That's at funny. the end that you see. Also, the, uh, when they're... When the um, older gentleman gets his marbles back and he flies and he sprinkles some mm. of the dust and like there's a couple that's kissing that floats up, the people floating up is George Lucas and Carrie Fisher. Wow. And you know the boo box on the pirate ship when they yeah. throw the pirate in the boo box? Glenn Close is that male pirate in the beard that they throw in the that's boo awesome. box. Like, that's Spielberg awesome. Like, Spielberg just like... Screw it! We got seventy million dollars. Glad close. Want to play makes a male me, pirate? Makes me pour- want to go back and rewatch it since I probably haven't seen this in ten years. Y- y- you'll see it, and you'll, the moment you see that scene, you like look it up on YouTube. You'll be like, "I don't see it," and then you'll see like the eyes, and you're like, "Oh, yep, totally Glenn Close." Wow, wow. very cool. Yep. Moving right along, we're mm-hmm. gonna jump forward in the decade and uh, go to one that I actually like quite a bit, and that mm-hmm. is Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. Yes, this is the live action version of the was it the, the headless the fairy, horseman the fairy tale headless horseman yeah, cartoon Ichabod crane uh this i mean obviously stars johnny depp yes. as ichabod crane christina ritchie as well yes and, and casper van dean yes yeah but you also have what's his name um christopher walken christopher the headless horseman, horseman mm-hmm. which is very very small role yeah it's really at the end that first he's time the headless a uh, headless horseman has ever been had, done yeah. with uh without the actor basically wearing the collar up around their head where it was actually digitally removed this is the first time and mm-hmm. that that character wasn't played by an actor just it's sort of now. i mean obviously the thing about this is i mean it's classic tim burton and they mm-hmm. took a fairy tale that was a little bit dark and yeah. made it super dark yes like the story, I mean, was always sort of like, be careful, you mm-hmm. know, you better but watch out. There was out a protective barrier in the original story. Once you crossed the bridge, the headless horseman couldn't fall. But that's it. the whole point of like a fairy tale, is mm-hmm. you know, you're scaring you have kids rules. Yeah. so that it keeps the kids in line. Mm-hmm. And this sort of takes it to a place where the headless horseman's just killing people. Mm-hmm. Like, he kills at least a handful of people yep. during the course of the movie. Yes. And Ichabod Crate is, of course, trying to solve this, whereas I don't really think that was the case in the cartoon. No, I think like it's he's more... just a dude who's yeah. like late and he needed mm-hmm. to go home. Yeah. And he's like trying to avoid it. Mm-hmm. So they, I mean, 
I mean, it's it's sort of interesting. I guess we can talk about this in general of all fairy tales, the ones we've talked about already, and this ones, and the the notion of sort of rewriting a fairy tale for a new context. It's yes. not just sort of like taking a fairy tale and making a movie out of it. Yes. It's completely reimagining the mm -hmm. fairy tale mm -hmm. in the context so that it is an hour off. Most fairy tales are probably you know. Relatively short. Relatively yeah. short. So usually so. parables or short stories. Yeah, or so it's, I mean, this is definitely one where they really dramatically rewrote it mm -hmm. in sort of mm -hmm. a Tim Burton fashion to make it. And, and I mean, such classic Tim Burton. I mean, you, when you watch that movie, one of the things that sticks out for you most is that every, I think, y you feel like you're in Sleepy Hollow. It's mm. so detailed and consistent mm -hmm. in the worldview. And, you know, I didn't realize this, but it makes complete sense for Tim Burton to have done this. The town Sleepy Hollow was created from the ground up in three months. In a soundstage, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, at the time of filming, it was the largest set built in England, and it was put up in record time. Yeah, I remember seeing a documentary about it being in this, like, gigantically yeah. huge soundstage. And people and would just, like, walk around it and be like, well, you're when you're here, you can't help but feel, like, the presence of the film. Like, it, it's everywhere. You're just But at the same time, it. like, I can't imagine there actually being some location that they're just like, this is just what we're going to film no, and have it no. look like that. I, I mean, know, it's I mean, clearly you know, super stylized. Nowadays, we have so many things that are, like, you know, either color corrected or fixed in post-production or green screened that it's crazy to think of, like... Especially with Tim Burton's style, to realize it would just be like a humongous set. But that shouldn't be any surprise that it won the Academy Award for set decoration. Yeah. It also was nominated for costume design and cinematography. Wow. Which, I mean, makes total sense because it's so visually beautiful. <laughs> I also think it's a strange bit of coincidence that this movie has uh, all three Star Wars Sith Lords as actors in really? it. Really? It has Christopher Lee, yeah. Ian McDermott, and uh -huh. Ray Park. Wow. Ray Park is in it? Yeah, he does probably, I pr I'm pretty sure he probably does the stunts for oh, okay. uh, the Headless Horseman. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. That's why I was like, I don't know. Yeah, see, Ray but it's Ray Park. Like... You never see his face except in X-Men. And this is also another one of those ones that, I mean, had huge commercial success. Mm -hmm. This might actually be I would the say most probably, successful yeah, I was one on this say, list. When Not... I was looking, the, maybe the very la the last one is close because of it. But I would say this might be. But, I mean, in terms of, like, I mean, this might have not made more money. Oh, yeah, than but this is definitely Hook. more, yeah. Hook made well more known. money than this, but this seems to have left a better positive oh, impression than Hook did. And maybe definitely. that's because the rest of Tim Burton stuff cratered pretty oh. much so dramatically. I mean, he had Big Fish after this, but most of but his stuff... he also had Princess, or uh, Corpse Bride after this, which was just... Mm. He had Alice in Wonderland. Well, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, Planet of the Apes. Like, <laughs> I, I think that yeah, might have left a, this with more of a rosy glow. Mm -hmm. Spielberg, I mean, granted, some of his last stuff has been hit or miss, but he had, like, you know, uh, Saving Private yeah. Ryan, yeah. Schindler's List, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. So he really, he rebounded yeah. in a very dramatic fashion. So people could look at Hook and be like, well, that's no Schindler's List. It's no... Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And this is like... This, this is, is the other way people look at things like Planet of the Apes, they're like, it's no Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that that's definitely one thing mm -hmm. about it that sets it apart, but you know, it's... it's. But you know, it's moving on into into the fairy tale world, it's not surprised that we, surprising that we bring up the next director. Yes, which is Guillermo del Toro mm -hmm. and Pan's Labyrinth. Yes. It's sort of funny in some context for me to put this on this, because I've, I, I don't I've probably spoken about it on the podcast yeah. before, but... I remember very much seeing the you know the still images of this movie mm -hmm. and looking oh like that looks like a great having fantasy a very film. one very uh, uh, specific expectation and then being very surprised by the actual film itself. But this is also probably this and strangely enough with the other labyrinth mm -hmm. uh, are probably the only two that really have sort of the context of a re I guess Hook does too have mm. a real world and then a fantasy oh, world yes. that they travel between mm -hmm. because. That was my main thing, is I thought yes. this was going to be all fantasy exactly. film. And there's a war story it's going like on. Spanish there. Civil War, I, yeah. I believe. Huge so, portion yes. of the movie that I had no idea was going in. Exactly. So much so, in fact, that when it began, I actually thought I was in the wrong theater. Hmm. I was like, what's this war movie? I remember movie? starting to watch it and being like, okay, I'm not sure where this is going yeah, at like, all. It, it, is, it is very much a war film. Mm -hmm. And if you don't realize that going in, you might be really surprised yes, by it. Yes. And, and that's not saying it's a bad thing, but no, it's something no, no. you should be cognizant of. Yes, I of. was told of that beforehand, and I think if I had not known, I might have been a lot uh, less willing to jump into it. Yes. It's, I mean, 
it's the story of a young girl who uses a sort of fantasy world to escape yes. from the horrors the, of the real world, world which, which is like Chronicles of Narnia is, literally yes. does that. They literally yes. escape the horrors yeah. of war. It's not, you know, it's not a story that hasn't been done before. But I would say the difference is the Chronicles of Narnia has much more positive <laughs> no, spin Oh, definitely. About it. I'm not saying that. <laughs> whereas this, this a... <laughs> doesn't necessarily work out so well for no. ultimately. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a scary journey. It's mm-hmm. a bit of a... Um, unfortunate end to said mm-hmm. journey, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it's probably it's probably a much more uh, obviously omnipresently violent wor- real world that you're escaping. Yes. It's not just the blitz is going on and this. Yeah, they they ne- you never actually see the bombing during yeah. the course of of Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. yeah, but in this, there's there's oof. half of the movie is you're watching people mm-hmm. get in ward. <laughs> and granted, she's that's, that's sort of the funny thing is they they sort of cut between these two stories: mm-hmm. her story and then the story of the war. Yes, like it's not her it's like in the father, middle of the war. I think it's like stepfather. A step- I believe. Okay, yeah, that's right. And that's part of the problem. Is that yes, he's that's right? He's sort of and step parents, man, her. step parents and half siblings. That's just like Classic. fairy tale trope 101. And in terms of the films we've talked about, and in terms of fantasy films, this is probably one of the most. I, I mean, even more than like out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one of the most sort of adventurous in oh, terms of the yeah. fantasy. I mean, mm-hmm. most of them are somewhat grounded in some I mean, sort it's of reality. Entirely foreign language film. Yes. Which is something in itself. I mean, th- it, and it's, I find it interesting that uh, Doug Jones, you know, who, who we've interviewed inter- on yeah. this very podcast, yeah. uh, who plays both the um, fawn and everything. like, yeah, most of the characters in the movie, the one with the weird eyes on his yeah. h- hands. Um, Doug Jones was the only American on set and the only person on set who didn't speak Spanish. Doesn't surprise me though, because he's done a lot of work with like Ron Perlman before. Yeah. I'm almost surprised they didn't try and get Ron Perlman to do it. But yeah, um, um, he actually had to memorize when he was playing that creature with the weird hands on his. He not only had to memorize his lines in Spanish, which, he, which he didn't know, but he also had to memorize the girl's lines so, so he, he would when. know when she was done yeah. to say them back. That makes a lot of sense. And he could only see through the nostrils wow. of that costume. That's the only place he could actually physically see it. That's crazy. I mean, it, it, again, you know, this is not a surprise. You know, this film won uh, best cinematography, Mm -hmm. best art direction, Mm -hmm. best achievement in makeup. It was nominated for original screenplay. It was nominated for original score. It was not it was nominated for best foreign film, but it didn't win actually, so that is a bit of a a tragedy. But I mean I also think it's interesting that Guillermo del Toro uh I don't know. For all I know, this could be really common in films. I don't think it is. He wrote and translated the English subtitles himself. I think that's great for all of it because he's he's been, had so many problems with previous movies that were subtitled mm-hmm. and not trusting the translators. Yeah, that's and good. So he's like, I know what I wanted to say. Let me let me translate it. And if anyone wants to write in why the lives of others was clearly the best foreign film of the year, I mean it. I mean, it's fine. I, I mean, I'm just I, I, I'm curious about that segment that's mm-hmm. really adamantly behind that as opposed to yes. this film wise. So yes. I'd like to hear. Some Maybe those thoughts. are like the 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 the. The thirty percent of people who went into Penn's Labyrinth not knowing it being having Maybe. a violent war film involved. <laughs> I mean, it's probably one of the most realistic films he's done. Yeah, I mean, which is about, funny to say about a fairy tale movie that it's probably one of the most realistic movies. I mean, he's you, done. you think about like no, I, yeah. I mean, I guess his earlier stuff when he was doing stuff like The Devil's Backbone yeah. and stuff like that. It was mimics pretty real. Did it? You don't know. Have you been in, down in the sewers of New York? You don't know. It could be. They talk about alligators. How, how do you know I was being sarcastic? Maybe I, I was face. being. Maybe I was I being honest. Face. It made uh, it made fifty million dollars though, so that's pretty good for the film. Yeah, and it's it's so beautiful visually. Oh it's yeah, it's, it's an amazing film. We had to do at least one animated film, yes. and we had to do at least one Disney movie. Yes. And for whatever reason, you know, we could have done any, but we yeah. chose to do Tangled, which. It's not a bad I choice. really like Tangled. I really like Tangled as well. And I think it's also an interesting benchmark for uh, the Disney fairy tale movies because they all were very much the same, you know, look hand drawn, stylized, etc. This is their first CGI fairy tale film. Yes. And I mean, you also got to note that this is it's not to the same degree as something like Shrek. But yes. it's a reimagining of a classic fairy tale being Rapunzel. Yes, kind of. It's kind of more in the way where uh, Hook has Hook in the title because Hook and Peter Pan are as equal and it's not right. all about Peter Pan. It's much more in that sense where it's much more about Rapunzel 
and Flint, I think is his name. Yes. Rather Flynn, than Flynn, Flynn, Flynn Rider. Yeah. Rather than just about Rapunzel. Sure, but at the same time, I mean, it is Rapunzel, and she does yes. have the long hair, and that's an element of the plot. Yes. And so it's it's taking a classic. Mm-hmm. Was it is a Grimm fairy? I don't even. I know. I think so. Yeah, I think it's Brothers Grimm who wrote this classic fairy tale, mm-hmm. and they're taking that. I mean, this is not some sort of like story that's being yes. reimagined. This is something that's you know hundred years old that they're taking and mm-hmm. making it updated. Also, the first uh, Disney princess film that got a PG rating rather than a G rating. Also, a fairy tale film with Ron Perlman in it. Yeah, he plays was it Stabbington brother. Nice. So, it, I mean, it's it's definitely interesting because you know it's the sort of imagining of Rapunzel if her wicked was it stepmother or whatever mm-hmm. sort of was trying to keep her down mm-hmm. and she finds out she gets out into the world yes. she enjoys the world and yes the uh, power I of her hair. The animation is really interesting for this movie because they did kind of a. Um, the director, I forget. Nathan Grio and yeah, Brian How- Byron Howard. Yeah, they were really wanted to like make it not just be CG like Shrek. And so it's kind of a, a painted look. Oh, it's beautiful. I think it's, it looks great. Yeah, it's a really interesting kind of different look to the point where they had to get artists in and teach a class about what they were trying to do so the artist could understand enough mm. to actually do it correctly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's beautiful. It, it was nominated for uh, Best Original Song, mm-hmm. which it didn't win, unfortunately. But I remember Mandy Moore and mm-hmm. uh, yeah. what's his name from Chuck? Zachary Levy. Zachary Levy performing mm-hmm. it during the ceremony. Yep. It got nominated for Golden Globes for Best Animated Film and Best Original Song. It got nominated, it won the Grammy for Best Song Written for hmm. Movie or Television. Hmm. Uh, it was also nominated for Best Motion Picture Soundtrack. I mean, it was, it was nominated for a Teen Choice Award for Best Animated Movie Voice for Zachary Levy. Check this out. At one point, it was going to be the sequel to Enchanted. They were going to do it live action? I think they were going to have a, a moment where it was going to be like the either a pre. I, I forget if Chanted was going to be a sequel to it because I, 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 I get the. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. And it was going to be one of those things where like this was going to be one story and then it was going to transition to the other story. They kind of wanted to make this to be the animated the world, world that had its own film. Okay. Full yeah, film. yeah. 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 I'm That's glad cool. they did its own cool. thing. Rapunzel's a good story. And I mean, you got to give a credit to Zachary Levy, who's very mm-hmm. funny on Chuck. And Mandy Moore is probably. An underappreciated actress. I mean, yeah. she, in stuff like Saved, oh, yeah. she's fantastic. So, good. so I, I think she doesn't necessarily just get the roles mm-hmm. she needs to do yes. to really showcase it. I but when she that. gets the opportunity, she's mm-hmm. really quite strong. So. <laughs> they had like, they got a, this like huge test audience of people to like determine what they thought were the most attractive features in males. They mm-hmm. got all these ladies together to make Flynn Rider's face. Like they had all these ladies wow. be like, what do you think is like the most attractive it's hairstyle like of these Archer hairstyles? Or yeah. yeah, that kind of thing where they were like got this big amalgamation of like the most attractive. Which, you know, they I think they do a pretty good job at making him not look hokey. I mean he does look like a dashing hero. And when you don't adjust for inflation, mm-hmm. and maybe even if you do, I can't do that math off the time I had this film made almost six hundred million dollars worldwide. So this it's probably the most successful yeah. film we're going to talk about. Probably. So it's not to say fairy tales can't be successful, yeah. but and that's what I was saying. Also, it's like you know when you get a Disney movie and a family friendly movie, animated movie, those are just you're just stacking up the right. like, profit it's, margin yeah. above anything else. You're so going to get. it definitely can happen, but it's probably not necessarily the most common thing. Yeah, it's probably you know half the time. Yeah, I mean because Disney has really been dominating that whole world with their animated films. Like yeah. they, pretty much mo- everything else has been like let's try to do a live action thing that Disney didn't do. Yeah, I think live action fairy tales have had a much more uh, sketchy track record than animated. It's ones, helped sure. a lot more recently. as Special effects have gone up, and yeah. I think that they'll with like things like superhero movies getting that advent up already. That the technology for it is just there. It'll be much easier to make these fantastical, crazy stories and make them look what, right. Yeah. Well, that brings us to this Friday, mm-hmm. March 1st. We're talking Jack the Giant Slayer yes, from director are. Brian Singer. Yes. Uh, huge Brian Singer fan, I think. Nicholas Holt, who's just killing blown it. Blown up. Ewan McGregor, mm-hmm. Stanley Tucci, fantastic uh, supporting cast. Again, mm-hmm. you know, sort of uh, a, a spin on a classic mm-hmm. fairy tale of Jack and the Giant Beanstalk, mm-hmm. where, you know, this time princess gets captured and jack decides to go up and try and save her from the giants yes who... and in doing so kind of lets the giants out of their prison because i think they're semi-imprisoned up where they're at you're... There, there's also that but they also sort of seem to and uh, neither of us have seen it at this point so Correct. we're speaking from the trailer mm-hmm. it appears that stanley tucci is able to take command mm. of the giants mm-hmm. from so maybe that's yeah yes yeah, so they're going to war yes yeah, so he so they go up there maybe he frees them mm. in some capacity but then they're 
put they're under corralled. Yes. Yeah, maybe there's some sort of spell or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Probably a spell. Fairy tales <laughs> like them spells. If it's got magic beans and two-headed giants, I'm pretty sure there's probably spells in it. But, you know, Brian Singer and the writer's Christopher McCrary, who wrote, like, The Usual Suspects and stuff, who mm-hmm. works almost all the time with mm-hmm. Chris uh, with Brian Singer. You know, oh, they did Singer. The Usual Suspects together, the X-Men together, uh-huh. they did, I believe... They're probably working on the new X-Men together. Yeah, I would, I'd almost I'd guarantee it. it. I mean, it's... It looks like a lot of fun to me. I yeah. mean, I... There's a little bit bit of me that worries about it. Since it did have quite a bit of like redo it, reshoots for the special effects. If yeah, I the special effects, right. and some people have not been sort of blown away by the special effects. I think they look fine. I, I think th- I think honestly, even though I think it's a neat choice, I think the stylized armor that Ewan McGregor and those folks are wearing looks way more ridiculous than the special effects of the monster. I mean, I think I think there's an element of fun to it that people are sort of taking a little too seriously, yeah. and I think that uh, it, I mean it just. It looks like a, just a fun film. And oh, yeah. I mean, I think part of the reason that Chris McCreary, or sorry, Brian Singer, has gotten a little bit misaligned is his last few films, Superman Returns, which I think was actually underappreciated. I think yeah. besides Superboy and not doing enough Superman y type mm-hmm. stuff, it, it, was, it was a decent film. Mm-hmm. And Valkyrie, which kind of got yes. maligned because of. Tom Cruise, yeah. and Not surprising, but it's still a fascinating story mm-hmm. about the attempted assassination of yeah. Adolf Hitler, which is a very fascinating yeah. concept. Yeah, Nazis itself. are always fascinating. Yeah. Hence, Apt Pupil, another film by Brad right. Singer, which is which is a great one. <laughs> yeah. But that was sort of more of a horror. I know. Film I'm just saying, Whereas, Nazis. I, I think <laughs> I think to try and sell like a, a positive Nazi movie, even if it's <laughs> yeah, about it's them true. trying to kill yeah. Hitler, <laughs> is sort of a hard sell, yeah. no matter what you do. So I feel like they did it in Iron Sky. That's a positive right? Nazi movie. Yeah, but that wasn't very well sold either. <laughs> <laughs> Just well sold to me, damn yes. it. <laughs> Maybe if you watch it a couple hundred thousand more times and get that money back. But you know, I think I think that I really hope he does well with this. Same I, here. I mean, he did so well with the X Men movies. He really mm-hmm. he was really responsible for the rise of the comic yeah. book movies. Yeah. And he's such a creative and visually oh, yeah. stunning filmmaker that I really hope people I mean, give him a shot. I mean, you know, I hate to, to say that like one one really good movie is worthwhile of everything, but the dude did The Usual Suspects. Come on, yeah. Like you can't. Still my favorite film. Exactly. Like, come on. You you can't you can't say that that guy. I mean, and, and yes, Superman Returns had some problems, and Valkyrie had some problems, but neither one was a terrible film. It's just that they weren't amazing films for everyone. Yeah. And you know what? I'm okay with that. It's it's sort of you know that same sort of. Issue that you know people like Christopher Nolan are going to run mm-hmm. into now. That like, oh yeah, they're like, like oh it's not Inception, it's or, not Batman yeah, or the Dark Knight Rises. That's yeah. a perfect example. People are like oh it's, it's not, not the, the Dark, Dark Knight. Knight. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. And sort of like you know it's still a pretty entertaining and, film. And like, you know even with its problems, I would still say it's maybe better than Batman Begins. I I, th- I think it's a perfectly fine movie. I don't mind it at all. But like it's because the bar has been risen. Exactly. R- Rose. 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 Put Rose. up there. Rose. The bar's so high. Up, bar's up there. Real yeah. high. <laughs> because the bar rose so high that like anything below that, people are like, "What the hell, man? This is a bummer." Yeah. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be seeing an opening weekend exactly. for sure. So, exactly. Uh, and as always, you know, check us out next week for our DVD rundown for the first week of March. Mm-hmm. We're talking was it March? Would it be fifth? March fifth? Yeah. yeah. And then, as always, we're on MacGuffinPodcast.com, mm-hmm. Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, mm-hmm. Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast. <laughs> Phone number, 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Blip.tv. We're on Miro. We're on Roku. Check in and get glue. Get some of those badges. Mm-hmm, Stick mm-hmm. them to Greg's face. Yeah, cover my glasses. I won't see anything. Walk out in traffic. Like Doug Jones. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, leave us some reviews on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And uh, we will see you next week. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the sun stars. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.